If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Matthew chapter 7. We'll look at a passage there in just a moment. And I will warn you, there are several passages we're gonna, I'm going to ask you to turn to today. And if you want to keep up, that's great. Uh, if you don't, I understand. Uh, but we'll read through a couple of different passages and we'll kind of flip pages here uh, several times uh, throughout our lesson. In the last few weeks, or, or through the last uh, few weeks, with maybe an exception or two, we have been studying, as I've coined it at least in my own studies, things that matter to God. And we started by considering that we as individuals matter to God. It's not just the body of Christ, the church itself. Uh, it's not just the human race or all of mankind. Uh, but we even as individuals matter to God. Uh, we then study that we as the church matter to God or uh, that God's people matter to God. They always have. He's always shown great concern and blessed the people who belong to him. Last week, we considered that it's our worship that matters to God. And, and we thought about you know, the time that we spend around the table and how, that, how we do things involved in our worship, uh, literally how we do those actions and you know, where our heart is when we worship God. All of that matters to God. And I want us to continue this study today, this morning, by thinking about the fact that how we treat others matters to God. And it would be, at least in my estimation, it would be difficult to read the Bible and not realize that God cares about how you and I treat other people. We might not always think about it. We might go about our day to day lives and, you know, move on to other things. But how we treat others matters to God. It mattered to God how Cain treated Abel. And it mattered to God how Abraham treated his nephew Lot and how Lot treated Abraham. It mattered to God how Jacob treated Esau. And it absolutely mattered to God how the Israelites God's nation of people, his chosen people, treated the nations that were around them, treated the foreigners who came to live among them, and of course, treated the poor and the needy who were there in that nation itself. And it matters today, it matters to God how you and I treat other people. Throughout the New Testament, we are commanded and we are instructed on how husbands should treat wives and how wives should treat husbands, how parents should treat their children and how children should treat their parents, how employers should treat employees and vice versa. We can read about how Christians should treat other Christians, uh, how Christians should treat those outside of the church, our neighbors or in the church, our elders, our friends, our enemies. In Matthew chapter 7, in verse 12, we find at one account of what is often called the golden rule, where as Jesus' ministry is just beginning, and as he preaches his Sermon on the Mount, which covers Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, in Matthew chapter 5, or 7, excuse me, and verse 12, we read, In everything, Jesus says, in everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. And so let's consider this idea this morning. Number one, God wants and expects us to treat others with kindness. Turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. God expects us, God wants us, uh, to treat others with kindness. And this is commanded, it is instructed, and it is demonstrated for us throughout the Bible. We know that God expects us to be kind to others. And in Galatians chapter 5, we read what is the fruit of the Spirit, the result of what happens, or the result of what is produced by the Holy Spirit which dwells within us that we receive at baptism. It is what is promised when we uh, bury the Word of God within our hearts. And in Matthew chapter 5 and verse uh, 22, Paul writes for us, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and gentleness. He goes on, uh, self-control against all things, there is no law. In verse 24, he says, Now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and with its desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. If you noticed in verse 22, as Paul begins that list, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Kindness is something that should be produced in all Christians. It should be something that is evident in all Christians. In verse 24, he says, we put aside, we put away the old flesh, all of the passions of our flesh. In verse 25, uh, what he's saying is, if we are going to be spiritual people, 
If we are going to live according to the Spirit, follow the guidance of the Spirit, have that produced in us by the Spirit, then that's what we need to look like. This is exactly what Christians should be. It is what Christians should look like. It is what God expects every single one of us to act like. All of those qualities, but especially for this morning, that quality of kindness. And that kindness should be on display. It should be evident. No matter who it is, we encounter. Whether it is with some member of the church or someone who has never yet heard or never obeyed the gospel. It doesn't matter if I have had a bad day or a good day. It doesn't matter if I'm in a good mood or a bad mood. It doesn't matter, as uh, the kids will say, if I am hangry or if I just ate a big old hamburger and I'm as happy as can be. It doesn't matter if I'm in a hurry or if I'm stressed out, if I'm overwhelmed by the responsibilities and the burdens of this physical life, or I, if I'm on some perfectly enjoyable, relaxing vacation. God expects me and God expects you to be kind to other people. That's what God expects. It doesn't matter if I say, well, you know what? I've got a short fuse, but it's not my fault. My dad had a short fuse. We all have a short fuse. That's how it is. It doesn't matter if I say it's just my nature. It's how I'm wired. God is still expects me to be kind to others. It matters to God how we treat other people. And it gets even better because he shows us what that looks like in his word. We can read how God has shown kindness toward us. In Romans chapter 11 and verse 22, Paul writes, Behold, uh, then the kindness and severity of God. There are uh, two wonderful parts of God. There is this kindness of God, but he can also be very se severe. He says, To those who fell away, severity, but to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. New King James Version in that passage uh, translates the word for kindness there as goodness. That goodness or that kindness has been directed to us. Every single one of us is a recipient of God's kindness. We see that kindness displayed in Christ throughout the New Testament. Turn in your Bibles uh, to Matthew chapter 11. Back to the book of Matthew here. We see kindness displayed for us, described for us in the life of Christ throughout the New Testament. But one passage that, that really uh, brings it out to me, I think, is as concise as, as we have it, is in Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 28, where Jesus says, Come to me, all who are heavy laden, all, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest uh, for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And what Jesus is saying is, I want to make your life better. I'm, I am a better way. What Jesus is saying there is, when you are burdened, I want to take that burden away. When you are struggling, I want to help you get through that difficult time. And that perfectly displays what kindness is. If we're trying to define that kindness or goodness, it is exactly that in the perfect sense. Jesus says, I want to help you. I want to make your life better. It matters to God how we treat others. And God expects us and God demonstrates for us his kindness. God expects that in the way that we speak to others, that we are kind. God expects that from us in the way that we act toward others, we are kind. One more passage here. Turn to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. Not the last passage of the lesson, but maybe of this point. Colossians uh, chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Paul uh, begins in verse uh, 12 there. And he says, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. In verse 13, he continues, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, uh, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. That kindness is something that we are required to do. Second, God wants us to treat others with love. He wants us to treat others with love. More 
than simply being kind, more than showing that kind goodness to others. God wants us to treat others with love. Look at verse 14 of Colossians chapter 3. In the very same passage, he continues, he says, Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And the love that that Paul writes about there, the love that is described for us is that agape love that we've studied for a couple of weeks now in our Sunday morning Bible class as we've gone through the book of 1 Corinthians. It is the highest form of love. It is the very same love that God has shown to us in sending His Son to die on a cross. It is the love that is regardless of circumstance. It doesn't matter how you feel about me. I am still to love you. It is agape love. It is not based in my emotions. It's not the pitter-patter of my heart when I see you come in the room. It is agape love, and it is a love that requires our action. It is the very same love that motivated God, again, to send His Son to die, and it's the love that you and I must demonstrate, show, actively demonstrate to others. We should and must treat others with love. And again, no matter who they are, No matter where they have come from, true Christians obey God's commands, follow the example of Christ. He is the head. We are the body. And how we do that is by loving those who are both inside and outside of the church. Turn in your Bibles back to the Gospels. John chapter 13. I think this might be the last uh, passage. John chapter 13. In John chapter 13, Jesus speaks to his closest disciples. And he says there in verse 34, a new commandment I give to you that you love, that is agape love, you love one another even as I have loved you, that also you have love for one another. And what Jesus is saying is that Christians should, disciples should agape love one another. We should have great care and concern for each other, not just about ourselves, not just our family units, But we should have that agape love for each other. Again, regardless of circumstance, not based in emotion and requiring our action. Not only should Christians get along, right? We share in something very special, sharing in the gospel, sharing in the blood of Christ. Not only should we get along, even though sometimes that is difficult for Christians to do, unfortunately, but we should love each other just as God loved every single one of us. Now, look at John chapter 13 and verse 35. He says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And now Jesus is saying how everyone is going to know that Christians follow him. He says, this is how people will know that you belong to me or that you obey me or that you are my body, that you are my church. If and only if, Jesus says, if you have love for one another. And so we might say, and those disciples might have said, well, well, what if we don't? What if we, you know, get along fine? We really don't have any big disagreements. We, we, but, you know, our care and concern for each other just isn't there where it should be. That action is required or a required part of agape love. What if we don't show that, though? What if we don't demonstrate that? I think what Jesus says is people won't know who you are. People won't know that we are Christians. People won't be able to tell that there is something very special about us, something that we share. People won't be able to know that we belong to him. But it's not just about other Christians. When we are commanded to love others, it's not just about Christians loving, agape loving Christians. We should have that same agape love even for those outside of the church, even for those who we might have nothing in common with at all or seemingly. Now turn in your Bibles. There is one more passage into Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Again, we have Jesus teaching here. And in Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 27, Jesus begins this incredible teaching that people had never heard before. And it will still sound incredible to us as we read these words. He says in verse 27, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And whoever takes away what is yours, 
Do not demand it back. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, here's now he, how he explains it. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. It's not hard to love people, to act lovingly toward people, to care about people who already care about you. It's way more difficult to care about those, to love those who hate you. Again, verse 32, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High for He Himself is kind uh, to ungrateful and evil men. And again, it is that agape love that we see described. It is that highest form of love, the love that is regardless of circumstance, that is not based in emotion, that absolutely every time requires our action. Number three, God wants us to show mercy to others. God wants us to show mercy to others. Look at the very next verse there, verse 36. He says, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. To show mercy to others is to show compassion. And God wants us to show the very same mercy and compassion to others as God has shown to each one of us. We know that because of, by the mercy of God, you and I don't have to face the punishment for our own sins. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 4, Paul wrote, But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even while we were yet sinners, or dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. God has been so merciful toward each one of us that even when we had no hope, even when we were described as dead, certainly spiritually dead in our sins, even when death was the only thing we could look forward to in our future, God was so merciful that He gave us hope, that He saved us from our sins. And again, verse 36, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. If you are counting on if you are banking on the mercy of God, if you are counting on the fact that when you stand before Him in judgment one day, He will be merciful to you, then you and I better be merciful to those who are around us. That's what Jesus is saying. We should show mercy to our brothers and sisters in Christ, number one. It is not my job, it is not your job to keep a tally of everyone else's mistakes. It is not my job, it is not your job to continually make others feel bad for the sins that they have committed in their past. To be merciful is to be forgiving, to be compassionate and forgiving. And when we forgive a brother and sister in Christ, that needs to be the end of it. That sin is gone. Forgiveness is not and should not be like the snooze button on the alarm clock that puts off that sin or puts off that grudge, you know, for eight or nine minutes. But but then all of a sudden, one day there it is back again. That's not how God, who is described as the father of mercies, that's not how God forgives. And it's not how we should forgive either. We need to be merciful with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We also should be merciful to those even who are outside of the church. We should have compassion for those who do not know the Lord, who have not yet obeyed the gospel. We need to understand or be understanding of the fact that the people that we interact with outside of this building are people just like us. They are souls just like you and I are souls. They are in need of kindness and in need of love and in need of mercy just like we are in need of all of those things as well. They need God's grace. They need God's mercy and His compassion. They need His salvation. The spiritual salvation that only comes from Him exactly in the same way and in the same amount that you and I do. They don't need it more than us. They don't need it less than us. They need it just like us in the exact same way. I think that showing mercy uh, to the world is understanding that not everyone grew up like I grew up. Not everyone trusts God like we strive to trust God. Not everyone 
you know, sat through Bible study this morning or uh, prayed together with a, the body of Christ this morning or came together and did those things and worshiped him. And that might simply because they don't yet know how blessed all of us have really been by God. I think showing uh, mercy to the world is understanding that a person might need a, a bit more of our patience because they don't know Christ. At least they don't know him yet or understanding perhaps that a person might have made some very poor decisions in their life. And maybe suffering the consequences of those decisions is something they cannot avoid, but they are still deserving of our kindness and still deserving of our love and still deserving of our mercy. You see, it matters to God how we treat other people. It matters how we treat our brothers and sisters in Christ. It matters how we treat those who are outside of the body of Christ. God commands us, God expects us to be kind and to show that kindness. He expects and commands us to be loving and to demonstrate that love. He expects and he commands us to be merciful and to show that mercy. If you're here this morning and you have not obeyed the gospel, it is by the mercy of God that there is such a thing. The Bible teaches that when a person hears the word of God and they believe it, when they are willing to obey it by repenting of their sins, turning away from their sins and turning to God, that person uh, can go down, confess the name of Jesus before men, go down into the waters of baptism and have their sins washed away. And if you're here this morning and you haven't done that, we'd invite you to make that decision. If you have been baptized, perhaps you have sin that has entered back into your life and it, it's sin that has not yet been repented of. The Bible teaches that when we find ourselves in that place, we are to repent of that sin, turn away from it, turn back to God, ask God to forgive us and he will. If you need the prayers of this church to do that, let us pray with you. Let us pray for you. Maybe you have another need completely, whatever that need might be. We hope you'll make it known. Come forward now while we stand and while we sing this invitation song.